Hey guys, I wanted to make a video on this case in the last few days, Roberta. but I haven't had time. But I wanted to let you guys know what I thought was going on because I think it's going to be solved pretty quickly. So let's get into the case of Debbie Collier. J is for Justice Podcast. Roberta. Debbie Collier was a 59 year old woman of Athens, Georgia who was found naked and partially burned. The partially burned part was her abdomen on September 11th, the day after her daughter, Amanda Bearden, said that she sent her in Venmo almost $2,400 along with a chilling note. And that note read, quote, they are not going to let me go. Love you. There is a key to the house in the blue flower pot by the door. Now the family is saying that they feel like suspects. Their phones have been confiscated by police, according to her daughter's boyfriend. And the boyfriend also stated he didn't want to give his name. But he also stated that the Habersham County Sheriff's Office investigators are not giving them many details at all. Now, if we go back to the beginning of the story, her daughter showed up on the scene in the very first news report, and I'll play that for you guys in a second. But her daughter showed up on the scene demanding answers and all this stuff when her mom's body was found. Now we're finding out that the daughter, Amanda Bearden, who's 36, has a rap sheet that includes battery, um, faking drug tests, fighting with her boyfriends, etc. Mostly domestic. And the most recent one was in May of 2021 where she claimed her boyfriend who the Washington or who the New York Post has named Andrew Tyler Giegrick. She claimed he broke into her home, screamed at her and attacked her. She showed the police bruises on her arms and shoulders. However, the officers from the Athens Clark County Police determined the couples lived together and they arrested Bearden for making a false report of a robbery. Giegrick was also arrested and hit with various charges, including battery. So that is the daughter. Of Debbie Collier. So now the daughter and the boyfriend are back together in the same home and he griped that the police have interrogated all of us the people that are closest to her kind of look like suspects right now there is no suggestion that her daughter or the boyfriend had anything to do with this but the police have not named any suspects they say that the public is not in danger and this is an isolated incident which usually tells us what? It's within the family or someone they know. And the daughter that you see here, who previously served 30 days in jail for breaking her probation, this is the one that showed up on the scene, screaming, whatnot, um, and also received a bunch of money from her mom in Venmo, stating, oh, hey, they're not going to leave me alone. Love you. And this is Andrew Tyler Giegrick, who is the, the daughter of Debbie's boyfriend. There's Amanda's bruises that she showed the police. And the New York Post obtained these in the report. 
And Amanda Bearden has accused the authorities now of suspecting that she was involved in her mom's homicide, which they have labeled her death a homicide. Now, this on the wall, I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but this is part of an evidence photo from their domestic. I mean, I'm assuming those are holes in the wall, but I'm looking at the colors of the walls. This looks like a mess. So the house where Bearden has been living is owned by her stepdad, and she has occupied it on and off for a number of years. She is also believed to have a good relationship with her mom and stepdad who supported her through her legal troubles. But on the night that Debbie was killed and went missing, they heard a commotion at the house. A neighbor did. And that neighbor said that the visitor who came on the weekend was a young girl and that this family kept to themselves. They didn't know who she was. But when I heard that the commotion involved a young girl... Her daughter showed up on the scene. Her daughter received the Venmo money. It all kind of points to something with the daughter. And now that I'm revisiting all of the updates, it looks like that's the direction it's going. So here's Debbie and I don't know who the man is. That must be Steve, her husband. So Steve was the last one to see Debbie alive. So he saw her at 9 p.m. Her car was in the driveway when he left for work the next morning. And they slept in separate rooms because of the snoring. And then a neighbor made a comment saying, you know, the GBI is involved and they don't understand why it's taking so long quote, they're slow out here. I don't think they're slow out there. I think that they're investigating just fine. And it sounds like they've narrowed in on some people. Not officially. But that is a little... This is the Debbie's house that she was living in. She lived in one of those golf ball houses. And there again is her daughter, Amanda. <laughs> Seems like a very troubled girl. So anyways, moving forward, I wanted to just share a couple of the shorts that I made in this case. Investigators on September 11th to find Collier's rented minivan, which had been pinged using satellite radio. The report says the vehicle was unlocked and no one was inside. A police officer stated he saw the same vehicle there the day before around Collier's 5 p.m. Collier's daughter later showed up to the scene emotional, begging for answers in her mother's disappearance. According to the report, she told investigators her mother did not have any history of mental health issues and denied any suicidal tendencies. She also stated that her mom had a bad back and couldn't have walked far. Kate's investigators saw a red tote bag near an uprooted tree in the woods off Georgia Highway 15, along with what they believe were the remains of a fire. They also discovered a burnt blue tarp and a naked woman's body. She was lying on her back, and her abdomen appeared to be charred. That woman was later identified as Collier. The day the Athens mother and realty office manager went missing, her daughter told police that her mother sent nearly $2,400 to her through Venmo, along with a message saying, they are not going to let me go. Love you. So there is the latest in the Debbie Collier case, which I think is going to end up being at least the daughter involved. That's my that's my hunch right now as far as, you know, speculating based on what we know. Um, I just thought it was odd. Her daughter showed up at the scene. Her daughter got the money. Her daughter has a rep sheet. Um, just a lot of red flags there. So. We'll keep an eye on the Debbie Collier case. As it moves forward. Now, the next update in the next video I'm going to show you guys is pretty shocking. I made a short about this. Of course, you know, me and my shorts these days. But I made a short on this 
but there is an eight minute long video of body cam and I'm going to play that right now. Um, this is the cop car that was parked on train tracks during a stop. Uh, why? I don't know. But you guys can be the judges of that one. I watch this and I literally cringe because they're standing on the tracks. And these cops in that area should know these are active tracks. And why they felt comfortable just standing on them, being parked on them, while waiting for the suspect to exit the vehicle is beyond me. Out of all of the police officers there, not one person thought, hey, we better move the car off the tracks. So let's watch that and then you guys can let me know what you think of that one. I'm right behind you, Vasquez. I'm going to your passenger side. Dispatch left in 346, one at gunpoint. Special up in three four six. We're getting commands. Her hands are out the window at this time. She's out of the vehicle, hands are visible. It's bugs. Yep. Okay. Hey. Want to go to this side? Yeah. Fast kiss. Hey. Lift your hands up. Lift your hands up. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Put your hands up higher. I want you to set your phone down as if you truck. You don't need it. You can leave it on. Come on back. Keep coming back. Keep your hands up. Keep coming back. Keep coming back to the sound of my voice. Keep coming back. 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 Stop right there. Get down on one knee and then the other. I got cuffs. Go ahead. Good? Keep your hands above your head. Don't move. What's going on? Why am I being... We'll explain everything in a second. Can I get my cell phone, truck. please? No one else is in the truck, sir. Can I please get my cell phone? We'll get it for you. Don't worry about your cell Where are you taking me? We're taking you to the car. Come on. Why? What? Do you have anything on you that's going to poke me, stick me, hurt me? No, ma'am. But can I please get my cell phone? We'll get your cell phone in a second. Is there any weapons in the car? Ready? No, ma'am. There's nothing on There's no weapons in the car? No, Okay. Everybody out in the car, come on. What's going on? on? Ma'am, what's going on? I'll tell you in a second. Take I'm a seat. so confused. Can I get Take my a seat. cell phone? I will get your cell phone for you. Take a seat. I got your right shoulder. I see a car seat. 
clear. Okay, let's get the bed. Yeah, you drop it. I'll hold it. I'll across. Clear. Dispatch looking 348. Vehicle's clear. You can use the channel. time to pull over. I got a holster right here in the passenger seat. Okay. I just, it took her a very long time to pull over. Just, it took her a very long time to pull over. I'm going. Did you see her toss anything? I, 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 she could have because it took her a long time to pull over. I'm going to put my rifle away and I'll come back Alright. She could have because when I was behind her, she was driving slow enough. Yeah. So she could have tossed something, but I lived Tossed it out the window? She could have, out that window, but. Who is, is that Hart? No, that's a. Uh... Tom Attack. Watch the fence. There may still be a firearm in the vehicle. I don't know if you guys have been through it yet. Yeah. You got it? I got a holster here. No, nope, yeah. we have not gone through we it. Weren't, we weren't sure if she threw it or if it's still hidden in the vehicle somewhere. It took her a long time to pull over. And Platteville said he did not see anything leave the vehicle. Right now, I just need to find out who she is so we can deal with that aspect of it. Who's awake? Okay. You hear that? No, I didn't hear that. There's a round over there in the door. Okay. That's her. date of birth on there. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> I know you know what you're doing. I was just thinking out loud. I'll let you look at that. I'll keep right. looking for the other stuff. Check the center console. You what? Check the center console. Uh, well, we need to find her ID, so her ID could be in the console. There's your gun. Oh, on to the another update in the Daybell Vallow case. Judge Boyce has ruled that there will not, I repeat, will not be cameras allowed in the courtroom of the Vallow Daybell trial. So Lori's lawyer motion for you know all this to be banned cameras be banned the prosecution agreed and ultimately Boyce ruled on it but they did say there would be audio allowed so we need to get clarification on if that audio is going to be able to share be shared live if it's going to be you know how that's going to work but I'll keep you guys posted in another update in Florida out of Pinellas County 
Uh, we had tragically a deputy killed here yesterday morning. And it turns out he was directing traffic around a construction site on I-275. And he was hit by one of the construction workers and killed. Well, this dude, dudes, took off because they weren't here illegally. They were working illegally. So yesterday, this deputy was transferred from the medical examiner's office to the funeral home and there was a huge procession. But I'd like to play a clip of the Pinellas County Sheriff giving some details on this horrific, horrific thing that should have never happened. Two construction workers are facing charges while the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office is mourning their second line of duty death in 18 months. Detectives say the construction worker who hit and killed Deputy Michael Hartwick with a front loader vehicle should never have been behind the wheel. ABC Action News reporter Sarah Hollenbeck is live for us tonight at the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office to explain why. Sarah? Yeah, the Pinellas County Sheriff says that the suspect was in the United States illegally and he didn't have a driver's license, so he should not have been operating that heavy equipment. He says what's worse is that the suspect took off running after he hit the deputy and didn't even stop to render aid. Detectives say another construction worker took that man, Juan Molina Salas's uniform, and hit it while Molina Salas hid in a wooden area off the interstate for nine hours. Investigators tracked him down using bloodhounds and the scent from Solace's vest and hard hat. He told investigators he ran because he was afraid to face the consequences of being an undocumented immigrant, knowing that he'd killed a deputy. He shouldn't have been here to begin with, and he certainly shouldn't have been driving, and he shouldn't have been working. You know, he's got, you know, which makes you wonder again with all of this, and he, he has no qualifications to drive a front loader. And, you know, what he said is, is that what he told those people is, is that back in Honduras, he worked some construction and he knows how to operate this thing. So they said, go ahead. Now, Melina Salas is now facing felony charges. His co-worker who hit his construction uniform is also facing charges. Deputies say that man is also in the country illegally. Now, the sheriff tells us that he's reached out to both FDOT and ICE to try and figure out what happened here and why these workers were allowed to work on this state project for a contractor, even though they were undocumented immigrants. We are wa waiting to find out what the results of that will be. Live at the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. And I don't know what's going on with domestic violence in this past week, but there has been some horrific stories. And this is one of them that um, I came across. He say co-owner of a popular New Mexico restaurant, Forget About It, was shot and killed by her husband over the weekend. Shocking 911 calls where the stepson reveal what led to that horrific moment. We have to warn you, the calls are disturbing. Reporter Faith DeBuyner has the latest. 911 emergency, what city? 59 year old Robert Yaconi is accused of killing his wife. 48 year old Kimberly Yaconi at their home in Las Cruces Sunday. I just before I just shot my stepmother. I'm in the room, she's dead. Disturbing 911 calls with Yaconi's stepson reveals the shocking moments that led to her death. My sister called me when I was at my house and she said that somebody about my father shooting my mother. Is she breathing? No, she, she's dead. What do you mean she's dead? I don't, I don't know. She's She's losing a lot of blood. According to the criminal complaint, Yaconi suffered two gunshot wounds to the face and back after a domestic dispute. What room is your mom in? She's in the, the, the parents' room. The shotgun killed everywhere. Okay, do you know where the gun is at? It's in the, it's, it's, it's in the kitchen. It's on the counter. Where is she bleeding from? She's, she's bleeding from her face. Okay, I need you to calm down and get something. Get the towel. Can you do that, please? Oh my God, don't you shot right in the face. Yes. Both Robert and Kimberly own two popular Italian restaurants in Deming and Las Cruces. Kimberly was also a member of the Doña Ana Republican Party Executive Committee. The Republican Party of New Mexico sent KOAT a statement in part. This was a real tragedy and our hearts go out to Kim's family and friends. This was a senseless act of violence and a blow to the Doña Ana County GOP and the entire community. All of us express our sympathies and our thoughts and prayers 
go out to Kim's family and friends. The case is still under investigation. Faith Ibuanu, KYT Action 7 News. Robert Yaconi is currently being treated at a hospital for multiple gunshot wounds. Deputies say they shot him when he charged at them. They later found out he was not armed. And this one's bad. But this next one is out of Chesterfield, Michigan, not far from where my hometown is. And uh, let's watch the video and let's talk about it. I, it. There's so much. It's like a convoluted, like a Taylor Parker, not that convoluted, but... There's a lot to it. Let's watch the video and then let's discuss. A terrible attack in Chesterfield Township kills WWJ overnight news anchor Jim Matthews, injures his significant other and their two young children. Matthews had been on the air for WWJ for the last seven years and the staff there is understandably stunned. Oh my gosh, so heartbroken. Chesterfield Township police say the man who killed Matthews and injured his family tried to kill himself but wasn't successful. This assault happened this afternoon in the Hidden Harbor condo community near Jefferson and Hooker Road. Mara McDonald live in Chesterfield Township with what else we've learned tonight. Mara. Hi, Devin. You know, if you take a look behind me, you can see the flashing blue lights. Police are telling us that they have finished processing the exterior of this crime scene, meaning what they had to deal with outside here in the parking lot. But they are still inside this condo. They say it's going to take a while. Um, when you hear what happened to those children in this house, I mean, it is a nightmare. Let me show you. Jim Matthews spent nearly seven years on WWJ as their solid, dependable overnight news anchor. Matthews was his on-air name. His legal name was Jim Nikolai, and he lived here at this Chesterfield Township condo with the 35-year-old mother of their two children, a 10-year-old boy and 5-year-old girl. When police arrived on the scene today, it was that 35-year-old and the daughter who had run into the parking lot looking for help. A 35-year-old white female had escaped with her five-year-old daughter. She was suffering from stab wounds at that time. The five-year-old was also injured. When police got inside, they found Nikolai had been killed, his 10-year-old son, in a closet. We also found a 10-year-old white male bound and suffering from blunt force trauma. And the man they say is responsible for it all, a 54-year-old friend of the family who tried to kill himself by taking an overdose. He's still alive. Neighbors who watch this all unfold just can't believe it. This is a very quiet condo. Like I said, I've been here almost 20 years. Nothing ever happens in here. This was, I was astounded when I came around the corner. And feel especially bad for those two young children. They were just really nice kids and I just really hope they're okay. Back here alive, those children and their mother are all being treated at the hospital. We are told that that 10 year old boy's injuries are severe. He is currently listed in critical condition. As far as WWJ, they have put out a statement tonight that really talks about how Jim was appreciated in that newsroom. They viewed him as a consummate broadcast television professional, that he loved talking about his two children and all their escapades at school, and that yes, there have been tears shed in that newsroom tonight. We're live in Chesterfield Township. I'm Mara McDonald, Local 4. Okay, so yes, this is horrific, but also very weird, right? So we've got a 57-year-old radio personality from WWJ, which is Detroit AM News Radio. We've got his 35-year-old wife. Now, I ain't trying to be judgy or nothing, but do the math. He's 57, she's 35. They have a 10-year-old. So she was 25, he was 47. When they had this 10-year-old. Um, <laughs> then you have a 54-year-old man who wants to kill them all. And then himself. Why? Why would this... Who is this 54-year-old man and why... What was going on there? <laughs> I feel like there was some kind of love triangle dynamic. And on which side? I'm not sure.
but that's that's my gut on this one. You guys can let me know what you think. That's my gut. And now here is a disturbing story out of Dallas. A Plano home being used as a short-term rental was the scene of a sex trafficking bust this week. Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Eager. It's 9 o'clock. Police say the people renting that home were using it as a brothel. Neighbors took pictures of the police at the scene yesterday. This started with a tip about a sex trafficking ring out of Dallas. Investigators were led to this home and they found a number of young women inside. Fox Force Peyton Yeager is at Dallas Police Headquarters with details on this investigation. Peyton. Steve, one neighbor tells me Dallas police brought out a dozen young women in handcuffs. Many of them had to be wrapped in towels. That's according to many witnesses. Two people were arrested, one of them, including the woman. Police say operated the whole ring. As mid-America normal as you could get. Yeah, it's just your regular suburb in Plano. Little did Chris Bailey know a home in his Plano Why is he smiling? was part of a multi-agency sex trafficking investigation. It had no clue that was going on. Friday, Sky Creep 4 town, captured dude. images of furniture being moved out of the short-term rental. Police say the rental off Las Palmas Lane was being used as a brothel. Thursday, Dallas and Plano police swarmed the property. One neighbor snapped this photo during the raid. 41-year-old Brandy Cliff, whose mugshot has not been released, was arrested for aggravated promotion of prostitution. 22-year-old Madison Hatcher was also taken into custody on an arrest warrant for assault out of Hayes County. Dallas police say they've been following the ring since July when they got a tip about a sex trafficking ring in North Dallas. According to police, by September, the ring moved to a short-term rental in Plano, like across the street kind of from the Baileys. Right I thought maybe, if anything, there were college kids, but just nothing that was abnormal. We don't know all the crime. Why would you interview about a sex trafficking ring in your neighborhood and have your kids stand in there? And you got a smile on your face. That shit's weird. This occurring because it's behind closed doors. Bill France with the Plano Neighborhood Coalition using this bust as fuel in the fight against the city over short-term rentals in single-family neighborhoods. Friday, a sign out front reads, Homes, not hotels. Do you want your children and your family to be living next to the operation of a brothel? Make no. Dallas police say many of the women were taken into custody, questioned, and then released. It's unclear how long the ring was in Dallas and then how long it was in Plano. I spoke with many neighbors. Okay, do you see the difference between Plano and, I, I can't with this lady's mouth, Plano and um, Grady Judd? The, the women were released. The women that were in this home, they weren't guided. They weren't um given therapy they were released to do what to go where they're gonna go right back into the same shit see this is what's wrong they're catching this shit but they're just releasing them right back into the same mess that they were just ultimately saved from in the last press conference with grady judd they went into great detail about how they give these girls all this information, even if they won't talk to them at the time. They follow up. That's what's tragic to me. Is that, oh, yay. The suspect will get a slap on the wrist and then all the girls that have been trafficked and abused were just released to go where? With what money? With where to live? Definitely something wrong with the <laughs> with that faux show. And here we have one more domestic that popped up. Another Houston details case. Details on a deadly shooting that left the parents of six children dead and an NCIS agent wounded. You can see and hear much of what happened in this security camera video. 
Jason Miles is in the Atascacita area where this happened yesterday afternoon. Jason, I understand neighbors who knew the couple are stunned. That's right, we hear that a lot, don't we? In this case, you never know what was going on behind closed doors. NCI, NCIS investigators were at the house you see behind me looking into domestic violence issues between a Navy recruiter and his wife. That's when things went terribly wrong yesterday. From one angle of a neighbor's security system, to another, the barrage of bullets fired during an altercation Thursday along Tulik Run in Atascacita is frightening. It was crazy. This neighbor, who didn't want to be identified, heard the shots, then saw an injured NCIS agent in her driveway, where crews returned today to clean up blood. Whoa. It was bleeding. Sheriff's investigators say an NCIS team was here looking into domestic violence issues between an active duty recruiter and his wife when the recruiter showed up first shooting and killing her as she held their youngest child, who amazingly was uninjured. <laughs> the drama the then moved Jesus, outside Father God, the Lord. and surveillance, the recruiter shooting the agent who was struck while others also fired their weapons. Whoa. The husband then gets into a black car and leaves the scene. He was later shot and killed by a Precinct 4 deputy constable who caught up with him in the Willowbrook area. This is a big surprise for me. Neighbor Andrew Olegban is among those shocked and saddened, especially for the children left with no mom or dad. That is horrible. Six children. This is going on so much more often or we're hearing about it more often. It is so sad. I mean, I just have no words. It's like, I don't understand. So on to our next update. 15 years ago, Tara Grant was murdered and dismembered by her husband, Stephen Grant, in Washington Township, Michigan. Another neighboring community of mine. And her body was found. Part of it was in the garage in a tote. The other parts were found out at a County Metro Park in a nature trail. So at any rate, she had two children. Husband's in prison. Tara is deceased, obviously. And now her family is coming back to Macomb County, Michigan, after 15 years. And I'm going to show you why. Grant's family returning to Macomb County tomorrow, 15 years after her brutal murder. You're going to be joined by hundreds gathering for Tara's Walk, a fundraiser to raise money for domestic abuse victims. Hank Winchester is going to be the event of that MC tomorrow morning. Hank, it is so hard to believe that so much time has now passed. You know, Dev and Karen, we all covered that story back in 2007, and it just kind of hit me yesterday. I could not believe it has been 15 years. But tomorrow morning, uh, family members of Tara Grant, people within the community, and, and those who just want to remember her and help other domestic abuse survivors will gather in Macomb County for a very important event. Take a look. Tara Grant was a loving mother and wife. She was also secretly a domestic abuse victim killed by her own husband, Stephen, in their Washington Township home 15 years ago. Tomorrow morning, Tara's sister, Alicia, and her two children, Ian and Lindsay, will be back in Macomb County for Tara's walk. It is absolutely so, probably the most important thing of our year um, to come back here, um, you know, and to celebrate not only pay, um, Tara's memory, but to also encourage other people to you know, watch for the signs of domestic violence to help their friends and family get out of those situations. Tara's walk is an opportunity for the community to come together to not only remember Tara Grant, her life and her legacy, but to raise money for Turning Point, a local organization dedicated to helping domestic abuse victims. I think about the happy things. I don't I don't really dwell on what happened to her. I use it as more of a message to help other people. Tara's children have little memory of what happened back in 2007, but they've come back to Macomb County every year, not only to honor their mother's memory, but to work with Turning Point. They don't want what happened to Tara to happen to other women here in Metro Detroit. 
Is there an emotional part of it that's tough for you? It kind of rehashes some stuff, which is about like when I was younger, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, I know that's like personally a little bit harder for myself, but at the same time, if I have to go through a little bit of pain just to help a little bit, like, every, like a lot of people out, I'm 1,000% willing to do that. Terrace Walk, kicking off tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. in Sterling Heights. Uh, registration still available. You can register online this evening. You can register in person tomorrow morning. Uh, the events will kick off tomorrow around 9 a.m., but the walk itself will begin at 10 o'clock in the morning in Sterling Heights. And I hope. Horrific story. Horrific. And you know, I hate ending things on a horrific note. So I'm going to end this on this update live on a lighter note. Something pretty cool that's going on with a local rapper in Detroit. And don't don't click off until you till you hear his story. It's pretty amazing. He's got a dream and he's using social media to help turn it into a reality. A Detroit rapper working to buy a lot more than just his childhood home. Rapper Trey Little is using his fame on TikTok to try to help raise money in a bid to revitalize the entire block he grew up on. That block of Tuxedo Street near Dexter and Elmhurst on the west side is badly in need of repairs. But Trey wants to go beyond that. Let's get to Sean Lay with his big plans for the neighborhood, Sean. Good evening, guys. Let's give everyone a nice long look of exactly what we're talking about here. The work that needs to be done. Take a look at this home behind me here. It is for sale. You can see through the trees and the brush. It needs a lot of love. A potential buyer right now. Someone has an offer on it. That's Trey Little. He's going to sink a lot of money into that home right here on the corner. Fix it up. In doing so, he hopes people join him by buying up this block and fixing it up, restoring it one home at a time. Um, so the original TikTok was like a yeah. few months ago. Okay. This is my childhood home. Some of you know that I've been waiting on the neighborhood to get better so I can buy the house that I grew up in. Can the power, the reach of one TikTok video help transform an entire Detroit neighborhood? Trey Little. So this is the exact house that I grew up in. Has faith it can happen. I remember sitting on the porch. I got a picture with me and my mom sitting on the porch. I remember I got a picture right here on my way to school. My school got tore down, but it used to be right there. The Detroit rap artist grew up here on Tuxedo on Detroit's west side. With a massive 1.4 million followers on TikTok, Little expressed wanting to buy back his childhood home. But someone bought it from the Detroit Land Bank for $1,200. So now a plan B. Little and his business partner are in the process of buying this home and restoring it. It'll mean a lot. It'll be something that I can come back to to say I finally have a foundation in the neighborhood that I grew up in. And this is a small step to buying a block and trying to repair the whole block. Little said, buy the block. He even has a new song called Buy the Block. The idea fix one home. Others will jump in and help buy up, fix up this block, bring back that feeling Little had here when he was little. I could literally walk this street as a kid and go up to somebody's door and, and they'll say, hey, you want you want some water, you want something to drink, you want some food. And it was like one big community and it felt really good. Because it's one thing to talk, to say, I want to do this, this is what I want to do. But to say, I'm putting my own money behind it and my own work ethic, then that's when it gets real. I personally think that is some awesome stuff there. Um, it's great to see someone, you know, take their online presence and make a difference it really is it's, it's refreshing so all right guys i'm gonna wrap this up hope you enjoyed these updates we will keep you posted and until next time dance it out i don't give a damn i don't really care about you and your problems i don't give a damn Talk way too much. I have heard enough about you and your problems. I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn. damn, damn. I don't give a damn. damn, damn. I don't give a damn.
face to face. 